join us. We're really excited to have you here today. Thank you for joining us for another event during our Young Professional Series. Um, this one is entitled, Is it Time for a Change? Some Conversations on Career Transitions. Um, we know that often as young professionals, it may be daunting to find that second job. They always talk to you about how scary it is to find the first job, but the second job may be more difficult. And making a transition between different industries, different companies, different career paths is also pretty nerve wracking as well. So we're excited to talk a little bit with some of our amazing alumni that are gathered here today about what that was like for them, their advice, their best practices, what they can do to support you, what they what they learned. Um, and we're excited to, to talk more about about that. We are going to get started in a minute, but I just want to point out that we do have the Q&A and the chat open. So if you have any questions, we're going to save some time at the end for some further questions. But if you have any that come up during the session, anything that we talk about that you'd like some more clarity on, please feel free to submit them as we go along and we will get to them um, when we can. And I want to start off by welcoming our three lovely alumni. Um, Rocky, Lisa, and Juliet. I'm going to give them a chance to introduce themselves since they, they know their experience and everything best and start us off with our first question here, which is, um, what's what's your career been like? What's the journey been like for you? Um, Rocky, I'd love to, to start it off with you and tell us a little bit about where you are and how you got there. Yeah, great. Uh, no pressure to start, but uh, hi, everyone. I'm Rocky. I graduated from the college in 2016. I majored in economics and I minored in medieval studies. Um, and I started my career, probably like many of you, uh, in investment banking. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And so I kind of went for the skills-based approach of let me just have something very quantitative uh, and be pretty sharp on that, uh, that front. And I did two years at uh, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch in a coverage group. Um, and while I was there, I think, like many other investment bankers, wasn't like loved the experience. I think it was very helpful in terms of figuring out how to be an adult, how to respond to emails timely, fashion, how to like send calendar invites, like all of that kind of stuff, um, work long hours, but also wasn't really getting that exposure to true finance in, in the way that I expected. And so I moved into a private equity role after two years um, and really actually um, got exactly what I needed out of it. So I spent a lot of time actually working with my portfolio companies. And what I realized while I was in private equity is that I really liked that portfolio company aspect of it and interfacing really closely with our team and the CEOs and just, you know, being really more on the boots on the ground. And though I liked the investing piece of it, I thought that part was more exciting. And so that's when I made my first career transition. Um, and I joined a seed stage consumer startup called A Day. Um, and I joined, it was number eight. And we uh, raised a Series A, had our best month ever in February of 2020. And then as we all know what happened in March, uh, the world completely changed, particularly for the retail industry. And I had a, you know, a really good run there too, like really loved being able to, like I said, be boots on the ground and, and deal with all of those crazy challenges that are associated with keeping the lights on and I was the only finance person on the team. So, you know, in many ways, acting as a, as a CFO would um, managing through a crisis. And kind of my second career transition, which is where I am today, <laughs> is in the education space. And that one, I would say, is a much more natural transition. Um, and that was because I had spent a lot of time in undergrad um, doing education initiatives. I always said that I wanted to go into the education world. And I think with the pandemic, it was very clear that there is an education crisis going on in the country. And I knew that in order to, you know, kind of actually like now would be the time to make a transition just because this is where the need really was. And so it was not, uh, it was a light bulb, right? It was very, very clear. And so I'm now sitting um, as a director at the Charter School Growth Fund where I invest in schools and help schools grow, um, help public charter schools get access to facilities and provide low low cost loans and other kinds of grant money to help um, operators and um, very interesting schools across the nation um, keep scaling. So that is a very long intro, but hopefully helpful. Podcast. That was great. Have you used your medieval studies minor at all in any of this? Because I, uh, minor. you know, funnily enough, no, shocking. Um, but I think it very much plays into the, it's a great conversation starter. People love it. <laughs> and I, 
tradition like I truly loved it it was like the most exciting stuff I did in undergrad as much as I liked econometrics that's amazing Lisa I would love to hear from you how has your career journey been where, where are you at and where how did you get here yeah sure um, so I studied math and economics at UChicago and graduated in 2015. Um, and after graduating, um, I made a couple of different career transitions. I transitioned from investment banking to con e economic consulting to data science. Um, and so I'll walk through each of those briefly. Um, so like Rocky, out of school, I did investment banking at Deutsche Bank. Um, I can't say I actually had a lot of conviction in this career path, but like decided to give it a try. Um, for anyone not familiar with what investment banking is, basically like we would pitch trans transactions to clients like acquiring another company or doing an IPO. And then if the company decided to move forward, then we'd help them through the process of executing on these transactions. Um, so day to day, there's a lot of financial modeling, a lot of like creating PowerPoint presentations. Um, I found the hours and the culture to be pretty tough. Um, and even more importantly, like realized I didn't actually have a real interest or passion for finance so decided to move into a job that was a better fit with my academic interests of like math and economics and statistics um, and also a better fit for the type of skills I wanted to develop in like data analysis and coding um, so I ended up in economic consulting at Nira um, which like from a high level was basically like data analysis for legal cases um, so like economic consultants are hired by lawyers to provide expert witness testimony pertaining to economics and finance issues and legal cases, um, and usually like the output we would provide the lawyers the written report. Um, so I did a lot of like data analysis and statistical analysis to try to estimate the amount of economic harm caused by allegations in a legal case. Um, I learned a lot from this job um, and really liked the data analysis part of it, but realized I didn't love like working on legal cases and I thought it'd be more interesting to be able to apply data analysis to like product and business decisions instead. Um, and so that's how I ended up at Dropbox in product data science, um, where I was like using data to help the company make better product and business decisions. So including like doing deep dive data analyses to understand like based on our user data, how users are engaging with a product and like how that might inform what product changes we could make to make their experience better. Um, I also worked on A-B tests, which are kind of a scientific way of evaluating whether one product experience is better than the other. Um, and I helped my teams like determine what metrics to use to measure the success and build dashboards. Um, it's a very like collaborative role working with a lot of different functions like product managers, um, software engineers, and product designers. Um, I actually liked the role a lot, but just wanted to try a smaller company. So I ended up at Notion, um, which is a small software company used by businesses, consumers, um, and also um, students too for note-taking, project management, and collaboration. Um, I basically do the same job at Notion that I did at um, Dropbox using data to provide product recommendations. Um, and I really like the work that I do there. Amazing, amazing. And Juliet, to round us out, what about you? Tell us about your career journey and, and how you got to where you are now. Sure thing. So um, I was class of 2019 and I was a psychology major. Um, and coming out of college, I was on the traditional path. I had gotten a um, boutique consulting internship my prior and after third year, had the return offer, was all ready to go. And then two days before graduation, they changed locations. The company was shifting. A lot of different things were happening. So I decided to not pursue that. So the summer after I graduated, I had to find a whole new job, which so basically I transitioned my career before I had even started. Very terrifying. Um, I was also traveling at the time. So I was like, you know what? I just graduated. I'm going to go do the traveling thing. We'll figure out the job stuff. I interviewed while in different places. It was an interesting time. Um, but I wanted, I didn't join in San Francisco, wanted to stay in San Francisco. So I was looking at mostly tech jobs um, and eventually got a job as a pricing strategy analyst at uh, Autodesk, so design software, where I spent uh, about two and a half years um, working on various uh, strategy projects, um, anything from when running studies for, um, for different products for, with the consumers to doing financial analysis to determine how successful a product might be, all those kind of things. Um, this, I was nine months into the job when the pandemic happened, um, so definitely a big shift. Um, but you know, had a really good time while doing it and learned a lot there. 
but especially after a few years of pandemic, I kind of realized like this was my first job and it was really interesting experience, but um, pricing at a software company was quite niche and especially given my psychology background, um, I knew I was really interested in consumer behavior and thinking about decision-making and kind of the world at large. Um, and I also knew that was thinking kind of about the future and I was thinking, okay, what do I actually want out of my next job or in the future? And I decided that I really wanted to work for a global company. I'm Dutch originally and I grew up in France. And so I'm very much looking for global opportunities and kind of having that global um, or just big reach place. So I was looking at various options. Um, given what I was interested in my background, was really looking at either like strategy, maybe consulting roles. And I eventually um, was very much focused on the company itself. Having worked for a few years, I really knew what I wanted and how important the company itself was. So I was pretty targeted in my approach. And um, eventually I uh, was interviewing at Visa and they had a few different roles, both kind of from product and they even had a consulting role. Uh, and that ended up being the favorite of everything I applied to. It worked out and I've been here for almost a year and uh, I'm on the nationals team in the consulting branch. So basically I'm working with Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Chase to kind of help them figure out, okay, if they wanna launch a new product, um, how could they do that given the wealth of Visa data, um, doing a lot of data analysis, what would the, what do cardholders look like? What are they spending on? What are they caring about? What are the different products that are out there? And it's really interesting. And I, I really like it because I think, um, again, it really kind of ties to what I was interested in. And that's been really, both what I've been thinking about as I've been changing my career, but also learning about as I went on, what really are like my core interests. And for me, it's decision-making, um, consumers, and that's kind of helped fuel me. And also the kind of balance between data and um, qualitative things. So yeah, that's very interesting. Amazing. And I love that you did the very you Chicago overachiever thing where you changed your whole career path before you started <laughs> your career path, which is amazing. Um, Lisa, I'd love to, to go to you next and talk about um, if it was, you know, at what point in your previous position did you know it was time to make a change? Because you talked a little bit about realizing kind of early on in your in your first role that you were not super interested in the work that you were doing and it wasn't aligning with um, your interest and your goals. Um, was that a hard decision to make or did it feel really natural? Did you like second guess yourself and, you know, is it, how, how do I know when it's time to make this change? Yeah. Um, good question. So generally like what's motivated me to make a change is I didn't, I just didn't see the, either the company or the role as a great fit for what I wanted in the long term and had already gained like most of the skills and experience that I was looking to gain, uh, from the job. Um, I like in any job, I frequently ask myself whether it's a role I can envision staying in for a long time and a company I can envision staying in for a long time, um, especially like starting around the one year mark where I've been fully ramped into the role. Um, I've had the chance to work with, work on a variety of projects um, and with a variety of people. And um, if it's not a role I feel like I can stay in for over the long term, which was the first, which was the case for my first few jobs. Um, then like I reflect on what it is that I'd like to get out of my current job before jumping in a new one and then like even more importantly what I'm looking for in a new job um, so in economic consult when I was in economic consulting for example um, wanted to get more experience working on projects involving like analyzing large data sets before trying to transition into tech as that was going to be like a really relevant skill set to have um, so like kind of wanted to do that before I made a transition, even though I was already interested in making a transition. Um, and I actually think the decision is most difficult when you're leaving a great manager, just because they're not easy to come by. But um, it happened to be the case that in the jobs that I left after a couple of years where I had a great manager, the manager ended up leaving before I did, which made things a little bit easier. Um, yeah. Amazing. And Julia, you also talked a little bit about aligning, you know, as you're doing the work, figuring out what you actually like to do, what your values are, what your goals are. Um, did you find it hard, you know, when you're deciding to make changes to make that change or were you kind of at peace with the the decision to make, you know, a move and go on to your next opportunity? Yeah, I'd say honestly, I was pretty at peace. I feel like whenever, when I made the switch, besides the one right after college, that was one I didn't expect to make, but it worked out for the best. Um, the most recent one, I, it, I felt very ready. I felt like I had kind of gotten everything that I wanted out of the previous job. And especially I, you know, we're all from Chicago, right? We love to learn. I kind of felt like I'd hit the limit of what I could learn in that job. And I wanted to do something different, learn something new. Um, 
so in that sense, the, the, the decision was pretty easy. Um, and again, to the point of knowing what you want, um, starting off in college, I really, even before that, really figured out, again, like people is what I really care about. So any job that has a real people focus will be happy. And then kind of along the way, really starting to figure out, okay, what are the different um, things that I'm looking for? And also just as you develop that kind of self-knowledge and really understanding what your skills are, what you're passionate about, it makes it a lot easier. And especially once you've had at least one job, I remember when I was recruiting, I felt so much more comfortable because I was like, I have the experience. I see the things you're looking for. I'm not coming right out of college where I'm like, okay, you know, my internship might be somewhat relevant, but I haven't actually been in the workforce, but I've been working for a couple of years. Um, and again, if I was really passionate about it, so actually, yeah, again, it felt, if I felt really ready. Um, and because I really knew what I wanted, it just kind of powered that decision. Sure. Yeah. I often, I often describe when people are like, you know, worried about taking on that first or even second role, um, that it's just the chance for you to figure out what you like to do and also just as much figure out what you don't like to do. Um, it mm -hmm. can feel like intimidating when you're in a role where you're like, I don't like these things. And it's all important to learn all of that because it helps you find um, sort of what your next position is. Um, Rocky, what about you? Has it been, you know, was it an easy decision to make the transition? You kind of did the, the, um, a, a different different transition. I feel like a lot of people start startup and go corporate. You kind of yeah. did the opposite. Was that a difficult decision to make? And um, or was it, you know, this is what felt natural to you? That one was so I would say of the two decisions that I made, one to go startup and two to go to education, the startup one was the hardest. Um, and for me, it was because uh I was very intentionally walking away from a pretty straightforward path towards both the money and prestige, right? And it was a moment where I had to like grapple with like, what do I actually care about in life? I could stay in private equity and just like continue hitting the milestones and like externally and people will be like, wow, Rocky is so successful. Right. But at the end of the day, it was going to be a recipe for disaster. I always say that, like, you know, you don't want to dread 70% of your life, which is your entire work week. Right. Mm -hmm. And I knew that if I like didn't make a transition and like actually spend time doing the things every day that I like, uh, it would be a really long, long career in the way that like, I wouldn't want it to be. And so that transition was hard, not necessarily because I didn't want to um, do the work. I actually knew that I would like the job so much better, but it was scary to walk away from something that was very certain. Um, but honestly, I haven't had Sunday scaries in like, you know, five years or whatever, how long ever since I've left um, that path. And I think that in itself is so much more liberating when you realize that there's so much more brain space that's freed up when you get to actually enjoy your day job. Um, and the second transition was very natural, like everyone else had mentioned. I knew that now is the time to make the shift to education, and I have not looked back once. So amazing, amazing. And and talking about you know making that transition, I think um, the shift between from between jobs itself is difficult, but the shift between industries and, you know, environments can also be really intimidating that, you know, you're, you kind of know the world a little bit that you're working in and moving to something totally new can feel intimidating. Um, I'd love to know how you kind of managed that, that transition and, and how you found it, uh, how you made it seem less, you know, scary after a while, Julia, I'd love to start with you. How did you, you know, making the transition, how did you, how did you find, um, that change to be? The thing. Um, I will say actually the transition was a lot smoother than I thought it was going to be. Um, mm -hmm. For one, I joined uh, Visa back in May and it was two months after they had returned to office. We're in office at two, three days a week. And already just having that a couple of days, they had a happy hour the first day I started. I got to meet the team and kind of there was a boot camp learning process. Um, so yeah, in that sense, I, the transition was relatively easy. Um, I will say, and again, I'm what now 11 months into the job what I feel like people don't really talk about is what comes after like obviously it's a big change in the beginning and there's a learning curve but probably for me at least in 11 months I've been there the hardest was probably about seven eight months in because I hit the point where I was like okay I feel like I'm, I'm not new anymore because at the beginning when you're new it's okay that you're learning it's okay that there's going to be stumbling blocks and I recognized that I was starting to get more responsibility and thus more feedback when things went wrong um and was starting to think, okay, I'm getting to the year point. Um, should I be getting promoted anytime soon? Should I be kind of where am I? Um, and especially because I started a role in kind of consulting that I felt very right for, and I felt like I had the skills for. I was also after a while, it was kind of scary how much I was still learning. 
both from the role working with clients just presenting things I thought I was very good at, but you know, obviously still have a lot to learn. But also the payments industry is completely different. It's always changing. There's always some new products. There's always some new thing going on. Um, so I felt like I really kind of hit a quarter life crisis a few months ago where I was like, okay, you know, am I doing enough? All of these things. And that's something that I didn't, didn't anticipate. Um, definitely it's getting better now. And I think what's really helped is um, a just being really honest with my, with my friends, other peers, with my manager, we had a good conversation about it, but also just really kind of cutting myself some slack. After a while, I thought, you know, I turned 26 this weekend. I'm very, still very young comparatively. And that kind of, that shift and just thinking like, you have time, it's okay. You're also, you're, you're at your own pace, not necessarily having to compare yourself to others. If this is what you really like and you're, you know, you feel like you're being successful, then that's all that really matters. So I think that was, that was a really interesting transition that I didn't necessarily expect, but it also shows like, again, that I'm still consistently learning and that will, that's what makes the job exciting. That's awesome. Yeah. Cutting yourself some slack. I think we all can do, can do more of that in this, in this world. Um, Rocky, I love you talked, I mean, you made a pretty big jump from, um, the world you were in into education. Was that any point, I know you did it in, you know, in undergrad here at U Chicago, you had some experience, but at any point were you like, this is kind of intimidating and scary. And how did you deal with that? Yeah, it's, it's huge. I think, um, honestly, it's a big, it's a big culture shift, right? I think in, uh, in finance, I, I think, especially when you first start in a financial job, like I never use exclamation points in emails, like things that are very, very simple. Um, never had to use Slack or anything like that. And now, you know, and I chat very like, I don't know, it, I guess it could come off as cold or harsh. Right. And so I think there was like a bit of a culture shift that I didn't anticipate as much. And then the work shift, I think, because I'm still on a finance team, I think the day to day I'm working with a different finance product. So this, you know, focus a lot more on debt than I used to. So it's a little bit of a jump there and it requires, you know, I think just like being more proactive, kind of what Juliet was alluding to, right? Like early on, like stumble quickly, ask questions and like really lean into the early period of transition to be like, I don't really know what's going on and not being afraid to say that. Um, because as Juliet said, seven, eight months in, they're going to start giving you responsibility. They're going to expect you to know. And if you're, you know, early on, if you're too afraid of coming off as, uh, you know, looking stupid, you're going to really regret it, I think, in the long run. Um, and then I think the other kind of, I think the, and I think that kind of goes hand in hand with like the other kind of second piece of advice that I have is just to, just to be pretty humble and uh, give yourself the slack to say, hey, look, I don't know what's going on and it's okay. I think that you can trust yourself to get further. Uh, I think we, always undersell our abilities um and at the end of the day like most jobs in fact 100 of jobs like are man created by man and so we can figure it out <laughs> they're not real <laughs> except for maybe science pure science but still so uh, i think there's a it's just about jumping in and doing it i love about jumping in and the stumbling early and asking questions is so helpful i think it can be intimidating to be like i, I know i'm new to this and everyone else knows i'm new to this and i don't want it to come off like, I don't know what I'm doing, but um, being able to to mess up and ask questions and, you know, um, fully address the fact that you're you're new and you're learning, I think is really, really important. Um, Lisa, you you moved between, you know, consulting into this this data scientist role, um, which are related, but, you know, new and different. What what was what was that like for you? Was it difficult? Were there times when you weren't sure what you were doing and how did you how did you manage that? Yeah, um, so I definitely agree with Rocky that like having to get used to different cultures and in different industries is a big part of it. Um, like tech, for example, is pretty casual. It's like totally normal to sprinkle cute emojis all over your work, whereas that probably wouldn't be considered professional in most like finance and consulting jobs. Um, and as far as like the difficulty in making the transition, I actually find that a lot of times it's more difficult to get your foot in the door than to make the actual change. Like once you've landed that new role, like it obviously takes time to learn the ins and outs of it. Um, but as long as you're willing to learn and you're getting the proper support and mentorship that you need to learn, it's not so bad. Um, so one of the things that was important that I found really important was just to make sure that when you're before you step into the new role, you're evaluating whether it will set you up for success. Um, so like between um, <clears throat> economic consulting, actually both between investment banking and economic consulting and economic consulting data science for me, like I knew others who had made that exact 
same transition, um, who I saw were really doing well in their new role, which made me feel confident that I could make that same transition. Um, and when I was in particular transitioning from NERA to um, data science um, and tech, um, one of the big considerations was figuring out like what the right company to transition to would be, whether that's like a mid to large size tech company or a startup. Um, so I talked to a lot of people. Most people advised me that a mid to large like more established tech company would be a better place. Um, and I definitely agree with that advice now having worked at both Dropbox, which is much larger and it's more larger and established and Notion which is a pretty small company. Um, in larger tech companies, like there's usually more established systems and processes, there's more mentorship available. It's like easier to carve out a small area to work on. Whereas like at a startup, things move really fast, which can be hard to keep up if you don't keep up with if you don't have that much experience and you're expected to build out a lot of the like foundational processes, which can be hard if you haven't actually seen like what those foundations look at, look like in a more established company. Um, so just like understanding like what type of company would set me up best for my transition was really important. Um, and yeah, like in general, like through every job, I've learned a lot about like what it is that I actually want to do. Like for me, quantitative work is, definitely an important piece of my job, um, but also like being able to stay close to business and being able to collaborate closely with um, people and other functions. Um, and yeah, like what's made the transitions worth it to me is that like in every job, um, I've definitely found it to be a better fit than the previous job after like I've had a chance to learn about what it is that I want and don't want in a job. Sure, and I'd love to talk about something that you kind of, um addressed early on in your, um, when you're talking about your change in role, which is um, how do you like, you know, you talk about getting your foot in the door and using your experience from, from before. Um, how did you sell your previous roles or experience when you're getting your current position? I think this is a question a lot of people have when they're talking about their, um, yeah, their transition between industries is how do I sell the fact that I was working in this area and now I'm moving to this area um, and it can be kind of, you know, a, a difficult thing to sell. Um, Lisa, I'd love to start with you. How did you, you know, sell your experience into what you have now? Yeah. Um, so when I was transitioning from economic consulting to data science, um, I talked a lot to a lot of people, including a lot of you Chicago alums who had made that same transition and they were really helpful to me in understanding like what kinds of things data science interviewers are looking for in candidates. And then I was able to better like connect the dots between how I could relate my previous experience to these specific things that interviewers were looking for. Um, and then like the people I talked to were also um, kind enough to share with me what had worked well for them when they were like doing these interviews to make the transition in terms of selling their economic consulting experience. Um, and most of the time, like even if two jobs are very different, you can still find a few like common common threads that you can then emphasize in interviews. So like for economic consulting and data science, um, there's a few high level things that are in common between the jobs, even though they're very different jobs. And so I identified those and leaned heavily in talking about those. Um, so for example, like both jobs involve taking projects end to end and like working through solving pretty ambiguous problems. Um, so I gave some examples from economic consulting of that. Um, also like, there's a lot of having to explain quantitative methodologies and takeaways to audiences, audiences that aren't very quantitative. So for example, for economic consulting, this is generally lawyers, um, or like you might have to explain a statistical model to them just when they don't actually have like a background in statistics. Um, in tech, like this might be like explaining a model you're working on to a product designer, for example. Um, so it's definitely very relevant. Um, and then like both jobs also required a lot of data analysis, working with large data sets to manipulate and analyze data and build <clears throat> statistical models. And even though like the coding languages I was using, there, there wasn't much overlap between the two jobs, just like having those foundational skills was really important to emphasize. Amazing. And, um, you know, Julia, I'd love to hear from you. What kind of, how did you sell the experience that you had into the the new role that you had? Was it an easy thing to be like, this is how it's transferable or was it um, a difficult, difficult sell to make at all? Pretty good question. Um, I think it wasn't, it was actually pretty doable because I think I was really 
looking for roles where I, like I already had the demonstrated interest, right? So somehow I knew that I, it was something that I really wanted to do and um, that kind of translated too. But also it was really looking, again, because I really, I think coming at it from two different ends was really helpful. One, just like we've all said, like really knowing what it is you're looking for. And I think it's the simple, just kind of, or what you're, what you are good at, where you're interested in, just listing them out and really going to the basics because there's some very, I knew for me, some very basic things I'm interested in, some skills that I had, um, you know, again, whether it's thinking about um, problem solving or communication or working with people, that's something that is for pretty much every role. Um, so really kind of stripping it to that. And that both helps me sell myself and what I was good at, but also really look for those other roles. And it sounds really basic, but on the flip side, looking at those job descriptions, some of them are very detailed in what they're looking for. Um, and that can really help because again, especially if it's some kind of more basic skills, you know exactly what to talk to and just take some time to think about it. Like, okay, how has my past experience um, helped? And it might not be exactly the same thing, but I'll have something that I've done that can be kind of applied to that. Um, so in that sense, you know, it is, it is a bit of a sell. Um, for me, like I was a psych major, um, which for these kind of business roles, it's, you know, I wasn't an econ major. So I've kind of had to think very, from very early on was thinking a lot like, okay, how can I really sell um, what, what it is that I've done? And again, I think really stripping it down to very basic, like what it is specifically that might be helpful. Um, but also to the point of Lisa, like I really, um, when I was in college, I did network at was, I thought it was really scary and I wasn't really um, using it, but like I really utilized my Chicago network when I was applying both to kind of get advice, um, get feedback, get referrals, um, really that kind of helped get my foot in the door at, at, at Visa and pretty much everywhere else that I was applying. Um, so uh, yeah, definitely kind of helpful. Amazing. And then Rocky, how, how was it for you? I mean, you made a pretty big change and transition into a pretty different world. Was that a hard thing to sell to people that, you know, I know that I, my career experience hasn't been in education, but this is new for me. Was that difficult or was it, you know, they were just excited to, to have you join on and, and try it all out? Yeah, a little bit of both, right? I think uh, I 100% agree with everything that's been said. I don't have much more to add there in terms of like doing your research and mapping your previous skills. But I also would uh, kind of add one of the things that I had a lot of on my resume was education volunteer experience. And so don't forget that like that also counts as work experience in some ways, right? So I spent a lot of time um, tutoring reading like one-on-one -on -one, uh, through the New York City Department of Education. I also um, you know, work in financial literacy initiatives. And so I really kind of highlighted those experiences as to say, why I know that education is a good fit for me. And the fact that like, it's actually not something new to me. It's something that I've been doing for many, many years. Um, and that kind of like helps make the, uh, I think the link a little bit clearer. I think sometimes on paper, when you look at our work experience, it's not hundred percent obvious why we're interested in what we're interested in, but there is so much uh, in our personal lives that kind of manifest in our, why we are who we are. And we shouldn't be afraid to kind of bring those out as reasons why we want to make transitions. Amazing. And I think talking about making that transition, the one thing that people, you know, are always worried about is do I have the the transferable skills? Um, can I, you know, take what I've what I've done and and move on to the next thing? And sometimes you do look at that job, you know, description like you talked about Juliet, and there's some things on there you're like, I actually don't know how to do that, or I'm not sure that I, you know, can can say that I'm experienced in this. Um, did you did you have to gain any new transitions or skills or anything or any new skills in that transition was there anything that you're like before I leave um I I need to you know learn how to do this I think Lisa you talked about that right where you were like I knew I, I know in the next job I want to be able to do this so before I leave I'm gonna um, gain some experience how did you how did you do that and what did you find the most helpful in that sort of skill building yeah um so I guess for that, like kind of a prerequisite to like making sure I had the skills set up for the next role I was trying to transition to was like actually under like having a good understanding of what those skills were. Um, and obviously it's pretty difficult to understand like what a job will entail before you're even in it. So um, like everyone else has talked about, definitely leaned pretty heavily on my network to like do informational interviews with them to try to understand like what they did day in and day out as a data scientist and like what kinds of skills they think are most important to being successful in the job and then like making sure that I'm gaining those skills in some form on the job and like sometimes that also required like talking to 
my managers to like ask to be put on specific projects that I felt like would be would better set me up to try to gain the the skills that I was working on. And so like it's important to be also proactive about like your own skills development and um, making sure that you're like getting what out of the job, what you want to get out of it. If you like if you don't tell your managers um, like what kinds of skills you're trying to develop, what your goals are, like they may not know. Um, but if you if you're very open about that with them, then like they can they will usually try their best to like help you get out of the job what you want to get out of the job like they want you to be happy in the role amazing Rocky was there anything for you that you were like I need to learn I need to build up the skill before I make this jump um is there you know or while you were in a position was there anything that you did to take advantage of sort of building up skills so you knew when it was time to make a transition you you could say yes I do have the experience in that when you're applying yeah I think the nothing in the maybe technical realm but the one skill that I knew that I would need um, when I started at the startup and then kind of for the rest of my career is what, how do you, as the only finance person, interact with non-finance folks, right? And I had to be much better at synthesizing and analyzing and like distilling the key information in a way that's digestible to the whole team. So I came from a world where we all talk numbers and spreadsheets into a world where nobody did. Um, and so that is required me to just like, I made a lot of presentations. I like pitched in front of the startup team all the time and was like asking for one-on-one -on -one feedback in terms of what made sense, what didn't come through, what did come through. And just really working closely with both my manager and then the rest of the team to be like, okay, Rocky presented all this information about sales data. It made no sense. But then the second time she did it, she used charts and it was much easier to follow, right? And just being much more intentional, like Lisa said, about your own development and figuring out what are the skills that are going to serve me in my whole career and how do I start getting reps at that uh, early on. Amazing. Amazing. Asking for feedback, I think is so, it can be daunting, but it's so helpful and, and it helps you grow into, you know, sort of being better at what you want to get better at. Julia, you talked about, you know, making a transition where you wanted to um, have more like face-to-face -face time with people, really people heavy role. Um, and obviously, you know, gaining some more skills through that was within this, these transitions, did you find you had to like pre-prep for getting ready for that? Was that a skill you already had or were you um, sort of building that up before you made the change? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I think at least the like working with different people, that's something that I had done in my previous role. And so, um, and that was kind of the thing of transferring skills, right? Like my current, it's client focused. So you're always talking to people and you have to sell and work with the different teams. And in my old job, because I was in pricing, I talked to sales, I talked to product, I talked to finance, I talked to everybody. So it was able to kind of slightly different, but say, okay, I'm working with these folks. And then you shift that knowledge. Um, I, um, yeah, so that was, that was one thing that I was able to think about when I was, when I was transitioning, but kind of also to the point that Rocky and Lisa make, I, I think also when I was thinking about it and again, thinking, what do I want? What do I need to make the next step? I really kind of took stock of what was around me and my company actually did pro bono consulting, um, work. So I was like, okay, let me get involved in that and actually like have something in my back pocket, um, to talk about kind of outside of my regular day job. Um, and so, yeah, that was definitely helpful kind of giving that little bit of practice, but also in terms of the technical side, again, looking at the descriptions of things that we're looking at, didn't end up needing it in my current role, but looking at some product roles, my, a mentor of mine at my, where I was interning, he had told me from the beginning, if you want to work a lot of these tech jobs, you need to know SQL. So I was like, okay, I taken a SQL, I was, I had the opportunity to take a SQL class with my old job. So did that, did a lot of prep for the interviews. Um, so kind of both from those both perspectives, both kind of from the qualitative side and the technical side, what are the things I needed to change? Amazing. And you now all three have mentioned your networks a ton, which I love. We're big supporters here at UChicago of using your UChicago networks. Um, I'd love to talk to you guys a little bit about how you did that. How did you find your networks? Um, how you how you utilize them? Um, Rocky, let's start with you. Have you like how did you find a, a, you know networking people here to support at UChicago? Was it people you already knew? Did you do outreach? Um, and how do you how do you use your network? Yeah, honestly, I think the number one thing to do is like remove the the shame or the the fear of like reaching out. So I think um, I emailed a bunch of people, like cold emails. Uh, some people I knew, some people I didn't. Obviously, if you know someone, it's a little bit easier to just send them an email. There's like less fear attached to it. But I just was like, you know what? I have nothing to lose. And 
I also was very liberal with the definition of U Chicago. So I also was like emailing people at, for who graduated from Booth or like the Harris School or anything like that. And was like, I also spent time in Hyde Park. Would you like to talk to me? And I think the kind of the one thing that I did, I, I think I probably talked to at least 30 people before I made the the switch to um, start up and then probably another 30 people before I made the switch to education. Uh, and the ways to do that, you know, I, is to just be like, I want 15 minutes of your time. I, I always ask for 15 to 20, so less than 30. Um, and I just said, I wanna ask some questions about like your career. So like a very explicit in the email, you know, what you're asking for. And then my subject line, I was like, you Chicago student, like seeking advice, right? So one, um, my approach here was just trying to make it like less scary. And then my secret, which is a great secret and everybody should do this is, um, I, you know, usually you don't know the email addresses to who you're emailing, but email addresses follow a very specific format, right? So in the BCC line, I would do 14 different versions of the same, not 14, that's hyperbole, but like three different versions of the same email. So I would be like rocky.jane at bamel.com, rjane at bamel.com, rocky at bamel.com, and put that all in the BCC line and then hit send. Um, and usually one of those would go through. Um, and that way, that's how you could like try to figure out what someone's email address is uh, and just try your cold outreach. So that's what I did. Uh, and it was super helpful. I think the number one uh, way to learn about things is to hear about others' experiences. So that's how I utilize my network. Amazing. And I love how it like very and like very ingenious to think I'm going to I know someone's name and I know what their email might be. And I'm just going to try out a different couple different ways to to get it to them. That's super smart. Um, Lisa, I'd love to hear you talked about utilizing your network to decide, you know, is how do I make this transition? How I'm prepared for the transition? How, how did that go for you? How did you find these people? Um, and what was that like to utilize the, you know, your U Chicago alumni network? Yeah. Um, yeah, so definitely second everything that Rathi said, um, like, you know, ask people for a small amount of their time, like be really prepared and specific about what it is that you're hoping to get out of the conversation um, versus like just, you know, high level being like, oh, I want to learn more about your career. The more specific, the better. Um, LinkedIn is definitely your friend. Um, like, I think I think someone told me there is something like 10,000 um Bay Area alums from UChicago, including like um, grad school and undergrad. And so like, I always know there's a lot of people out here that I could reach reach out to, like we'll probably work in tech and just have to kind of find them. And LinkedIn is definitely a great tool for that. You can even do like pretty advanced searches, like looking for people who went to UChicago and then worked for company A in the past and now they're a company B. Um, and yeah, the other thing is just like, um, don't, don't be afraid to reach out to people who are like a little bit older alums too. Um, like I just talked to someone from UChicago yesterday who is a second year at the university, like happy to talk to people even if they're like pretty, <clears throat> if they're like in a very different stage than I am. Um, and um, occasionally you might get someone who doesn't respond or says that they don't have time. Um, like, yeah, don't, don't worry too much about that. Like there are definitely tons of people who are willing to help. Amazing, amazing. Julia, and how about you? How how did you utilize your UChicago network um, in making this, this transition? Did you find anyone that was like super helpful uh, or able to give you some advice as you made changes? Yeah, I definitely totally agree with the other what the other two have said. Basically did the same thing. When I was recruiting LinkedIn, 100 percent my friend. Um, and I think when because I was making this when I was making the transition, I was very targeted on company. And I pretty much knew I had my short list of let's say five companies that I really wanted to work at. And then I had kind of the B list and the blah, blah, blah. So that made it really easy when I was looking. So I was like, okay, company A, who do I know? Who from Chicago went there or works there? Um, and then, you know, ideally if they had some kind of maybe a shared major or had done, a, like I was in, worked in admissions. Someone I talked to had also worked in admissions. So we kind of had that starting point. But regardless, just having some new Chicago connection I found was really all that was needed. Um, everyone was very liked having the connection was very open to talk and was happy to help out um so yeah that was really the main thing and I think again being really targeted but when, what I found in those conversations and again very much what the other two said about how to structure those but what I found to really make them the most helpful besides obviously maybe getting a referral or getting the advice 
was just coming in with really targeted questions. Again, at that point, I had worked for two and a half years, so I really knew what kind of, or at least then, what kind of manager I was looking for, what company culture. For me, big things were about company like decision making and how communication was passing down top to bottom. Those are some pain points I've had at my old job, and I really wanted to see how that was working in the future. So um, again, really coming in with very targeted questions, and that also made the people I was talking to very happy to talk to me. They're like, okay, you know, I would. That's actually something I haven't heard before and would love to talk about. And also, you know, it wasn't just, oh, can you tell me about your job and then have them talk for 20 minutes. They kind of guiding that conversation was very helpful. Amazing. And you brought up a point that I'd love to ask you guys that I think is really interesting because you said when you were targeting jobs, you were looking at companies specifically. Um, was that like a, a, a choice that you made where you knew like, I want to go to this company. Let me see what kind of role I can fit. Or were you looking like, was it company first or was it role first? I think that's always an interesting uh, question to ask anyone making a transition is, do you know what role you want to go into? Or do you know kind of like what world you want to join um, and the role can kind of fit from there? Julia, I'll start with you since you, since you brought it up beautifully, how did you make that decision to say, I, you know, I want to go in a certain company direction and not Mm -hmm. just like applying to every role that sounds uh, relevant? Right. I think it really depends on what point of what point of your career, or what point of like your life and your decisions you're in. Right out of college, it was very much the role, and because I really just wanted something specific. But after my first job, I'm thinking, okay, do I want to go to grad school at one point? Again, given my international background, do I want to be whether with that same company or have that company as the thing on my resume to then, if I'm applying for a job somewhere in the world, that they'll know where it is and it's you know globally recognized place. Um, so again, for me, it was very much the company. And again, given already having that experience with one company, I kind of knew, okay, the company itself is really important. And because I'm still kind of early in my career, I knew again, the skills that I was looking for, but not particularly locked into one thing and also was open to trying new things. So that was really what guided me for the company specifically. But I think that might change at different points in the more I know. Amazing. And Lisa, you talked about, you know, you were at sort of a larger company with Dropbox and made the decision to jump to, you know, a similar role in a, in a smaller organization. Um, have you always targeted sort of, I want this kind of company, I want this kind of place to work, or um, were you looking for certain roles and, and the company kind of size, culture, everything came secondary? Yeah, I usually try to be pretty targeted about what type of company it is that I'm looking for, um, you know, whether that's like the company size, the industry, um, like the the type of product that they have, like like definitely lots of different considerations. Um, and like I usually start with just making a list, long list of companies that I might be interested in, um, like kind of prioritizing which ones I'm more versus less interested in, um, seeing like what roles they have open because like it might be a really great company, but if they don't have any roles open, then that's not, not as useful. Um, if I'm lucky, like I might have some connections or even like other UChicago alums. I know at some of these companies that I can ask about things like culture. Um, and then generally, like I'll just interview for a number of companies, like wherever I'm able to get interviews. And you definitely learn a lot through the interview process as well. Um, like talking to the recruiter and all of your interviewers, like asking questions about the end, about at the end, about things that you're interested in learning about the company. Amazing. And Rocky, for you, when you made this, these transitions, um, was it there a specific, you know, role you, you wanted to go in education? Were you looking at specific startups or was it kind of, I'm going to look at the education world holistically and find a role that makes the most sense for me there? Yeah, no, I think for me, I feel like my education switch was pretty serendipitous, but it came from just having a lot of networking conversations. I knew that I wanted to stay in some sort of finance role but I didn't know what that looked like within education. So most, I was like, oh, my most likely bet is an ed tech because I came from the startup world. So I'll probably stay in startups. Uh, but it was through a series of conversation, actually, the job that I have currently is because my best friend from high school connected me with one of his friends. And I talked to that guy and he was like, we're going to post a job in two weeks and you should apply to that. And that's the job that I have now, right? So um, I think... I didn't even know that it were like, I, I basically work at a foundation. So we just give you know money away. I didn't even know that was a thing that existed. Uh, and so this is why I think that really having these conversations is really helpful because you can have, you can try on different jobs um, and have a sense of like what you would actually like. And so um, very serendipitous, like I said, my criteria was finance plus education. <laughs> 
Amazing, amazing. Well, I want to leave the last few moments here for us to get to some Q&A questions. So if anyone has any that they wanted to ask, um, please feel free to throw them in. But we had one that came in early um, in our in our registration that I'd love to ask you all because you've all made career transitions in the past career transitions in the past few years, um, which has been a daunting few years to make job changes in. Um, talked about, you know, pandemic changes. Right now we're in these uncertain economic times that have, I feel like, been uncertain for, for a very long time. Um, was that at all daunting to you all to make these, these changes? Um, or was it sort of, you know, I want to make a change and I'm going to let the world craziness sort of fade to the background. Um, Julia, I'd like to talk to you because you obviously graduated um, and then immediately, almost immediately entered in a unprecedented global pandemic that I'm sure made some things a little bit uncertain for you. Yeah, sure thing. And I think it did make it hard because I'll be honest, I knew pretty early into my prior job that while I was you know, it was really interesting and I was learning a lot. It wasn't quite the right fit, both from like kind of a company and from a job perspective. And so I was already kind of thinking about what I wanted in March of 2020 and then the pandemic hit. Um, and yeah, I'll be honest, that did kind of not necessarily make it mean that the conditions, I didn't even really try to recruit. I was just thinking, okay, well, there's a pandemic. I don't really know what to do. And so I kind of st stuck around for a while, um, which in hindsight, you know, maybe I could have been happier somewhere else. But at the end of the day, I know I was working it for a very good company. They had you know, great benefits. I felt very looked after. So, you know, don't necessarily regret that decision. I'm not going to regret it, it happened. Um, and then when I actually eventually decided to transition, it was what, April, March of last year, which was coming off of that big kind of great resignation time. So it was actually a really good time to switch. I had seen a lot of my friends switch the prior October. Um, but I also just kind of hit a point where I was like, I, I need, I need to switch. So even if it had been April of 2020 at that time, you know, it just kind of felt like the right time. Um, and it definitely, yeah, I would say it didn't necessarily make it because I didn't really necessarily try. I was in a good time. So it wasn't like the pandemic made it harder for me to find a new job, but it definitely altered my perspective on what I wanted and really made me think about, okay, you know, we can't go outside. There's so many things we can't do. I have limited time and resources and, you know, we have limited time out there. What do I really want to do both in like my personal life, but also definitely from a professional perspective. Amazing. And Rocky, you obviously made the transition into an industry because of the pandemic um, a little bit, but also just moving to, you know, the worlds of startup can often be a bit, a bit daunting when you're making that transition. Um, how did, was that, was that a part of your decision-making factor was, you know, I'm, I'm moving into a world that can be uncertain. I'm moving into a, um, you know, a field that can be uncertain and certainly into startups, which can be uncertain. Um, how did you, how did you manage that? Or was that not on your mind? You just knew I want to do this and I'll see how it goes. No, it's definitely on my mind. And I think what made it a little easier is I was 25. Um, and I was like, my risk appetite is the highest it'll ever be right. No kids, uh, paid off the debt. Like, if not now, like then when? And I think that's a common refrain I've heard from a lot of people, right? They're like, oh, I really wanted to leave, you know, my consulting job. And now 15 years have passed and it's it's too good and I can't leave now, right? And it's like, I knew that the longer that you stay, the harder it gets to make the And sometimes it's about ripping a Band-Aid off. Um, and so I knew that I should just do it when I'm 25. If the company failed, I'd be like, I'd be able to figure it out. Um, company's doing really well. You know, I learned a lot. It was great. Um, and so I think that was kind of the push that I needed. Uh, and I think the other thing to remember is that there are many paths to roll, right? So one decision is not the only, it's not, it's never, nothing is ever permanent unless you want it to be. And so there are other ways you can, people will weave in and out of pro nonprofit and, and for profit and, you know, startup and corporate and things like that. And it's just part of the journey. So Amazing. And Lisa, obviously you made a transition um, from, you know, a larger company to a smaller company. Not that Notion is necessarily, I think, what we think of of a typical startup anymore, um, but you made that transition that can be a bit, a bit scary. Um, was it scary or was it was something that you kind of were able to, to make with ease? Um, how did you, how did you manage sort of that jump from um, sort of a, a, a larger entity into something that maybe is a little bit smaller and uncertain? Yeah, um, so I joined Notion in March of 2021. Back then, like, I was at Dropbox. Dropbox was 3,000 people, and Notion is actually only, like, 100 people back then. Now it's, like, a 500-employee company, so it's grown a lot. Um, and 100 people was, like, 
smaller than the company I had originally wanted to go to. Um, like it did, it did feel a little bit scary in that, like in my function, there were only two other people and I was like owning this um, huge area just because like the team was so small and it included a lot of areas I'd never been exposed to before. So definitely scary, um, but, but in a good way, like I, I think I was pretty ready for a new challenge and um, like new learning opportunities. I will say like onboarding remotely was pretty difficult um, compared to onboarding in person, um, just like like having to do everything over Zoom meetings and like, you know, sending sending messages to people async and waiting for them to reply. It's like not quite as like fluid as onboarding at work where you maybe have your mentor even like sitting next to you who can help you out at any time. Amazing, amazing. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, this has been such a, a helpful and important conversation, I think. Um, I really appreciate everyone's time. I appreciate everyone who joined us in the chat and, and participated. Um, we hope that you found this conversation as engaging and as helpful as I did. Um, I am going to throw one event in the chat that we have coming up that I think will be really interesting to everyone. Um, we're having a fireside chat with one of our amazing alumni, um, Rubel Patel, who is based in London, but started her career after UChicago as a CIA agent and is now um, on her way to being a CEO or is a CEO, um, an entrepreneur. And I think this would be a great conversation for anyone who's wondering, how do you make pretty intense career changes? Um, but again, thank you all for joining us. We will get in this recording along with some other materials out to you by the end of the week. Um, and we hope you have a great rest of your week.